story cape cod stories story three the south shore weather bureau but says captain jonadab and me together jest as if we was readin in concert same as the youngsters do in school but we says will it work will anybody pay for it work says peter t with his fingers in the armholes of the double-breasted danger signal that he called a vest and with his cigar tilted up till you'd think twould set his hat brim afire work says he well maybe twouldn't work if the ordinary brand of canned lobster was running but with me to jerk the lever and sound the loud timbrel why say it's like stealing money from a blind cripple that's hard a hearing yes i know says captain jonadab but this ain't like startin the old home house that was openin up a brand new kind of hotel that nobody ever heard of before this is peddlin weather prophecies when there's the government weather bureau runnin opposition not to mention the old farmer's almanac and i don't know how many more he says brown took his patent leathers down off the rail of the piazza give the ashes of his cigar a flip he knocked them into my hat that was on the floor side of his chair but he was too excited to mind and he says confound it man he says you can throw more cold water than a fire engine old farmer's almanac this isn't any about this time look out for snow business and it ain't any washington colts law like weather for new england and rocky mountains tuesday to friday cold to warm well done on the edges with a rare streak in the middle preceded or followed by rain snow or clearing wind north to south varying east and west no siree this is to-day's weather for cape cod served right off the griddle on a hot plate and cooked by the chef at that you don't realize what a regular dime museum wonder that feller is he says well i suppose we didn't you see jonadab and me like the rest of the folks around wellmouth had come to take berea crocker and his weather notions as the regular thing like baked beans on a saturday night berea he ah uh, but there i've been sailing stern first let's get her headed right if we ever expect to turn the first mark you see twas this way twas in the early parts of may follerin the year that the old home house was opened we'd had the place all painted up decks holly-stoned bunks overhauled and one thing or another and the old home was all taut and shipshape ready for the crew boarders i mean passages was booked all through the summer and it looked as if our second season would be better than our first then the dillaway girl she was christened lobelia like her mother but she'd painted it out and cruised under the name of bell since the family got rich she thought twould be nice to have what she calls a spring house party for her particular friends for the regular season opened so peter he being engaged at the time and consequent in that condition where he'd have put on horns and mood if she'd give the order he thought twould be nice too and for a week it was all hands on deck getting ready for the house party two days afore the thing was to go off the ways brown gets a letter from bell and in it says she's invited a whole lot of folks from chicago and new york and boston and the land knows where and that they'd never been to the cape and she wants to show em what a quaint place it is can't you get says she two or three delightful queer old longshore characters to be at work round the hotel it'll give such a touch of local color she says so out comes peter with the letter barzilla he says to me i want some characters know anybody that's a character well says i there's nate slocum over to orem he'd steal anything that want spiked down he's about the toughest character i can think of offhand this way oh thunder says brown i don't want a crook that wouldn't be any novelty to this crowd he says what i'm after is old stick a feller with pigeons in his loft not a lunatic but just a queer genius little queerer than you and the captain here after a while we got his drift and i happened to think of Berea and his chum even cobb 
They lived in a little shanty over to Skakit Paint and got their living lobstering and so on. Both of them had saved a few thousand dollars, but you couldn't get a cent of it without giving them ether. And they'd rather live like Portuguese than white men any day, unless they was paid to change. Beria's pet ID was foretelling what the weather was going to be, and he could do it, too, better'n anybody I ever see. He'd smell a storm further'n a cat can smell fish, and he hardly ever made a mistake. Prided himself on it, you understand, like a boy does on his first long pants. His prophecies was his idols, so to speak, and you couldn't have hired him to foretell what he knew was wrong, not for no money. Peter said Maria and Eben was just the sort of cards he was looking for, and drove right over to see him. He hooked him, too. I knew he would. He could talk a come outer into believing that a Unitarian wasn't booked for Tophet if he set out to. So the special train from Boston brought the house party down, and our two-seated buggy brought Maria and Eben over. They didn't have anything to do but look picturesque and say, I snum and I swan de man, and they could do that to the skipper's taste. The city folks thought they was just too dear and odd for anything, and made em bigger fools than ever, which wa'n't necessary. The second day of the party was to be a sailing trip clear down to the life-saving station at Setucket Beach. It certainly looked as if twas going to storm, and the government prediction said it was, but Berea said no, and stuck out that twould clear up by and by. Peter wanted to know what I thought about their startin', and I told him that twas my experience that where weather was concerned, Berea was a good safe anchorage. So they sailed away, and sure enough, it cleared up fine. And the next day the government fellow said, clear and Berea said, rain, and she poured a flood. And after three or four such experiences, Berea was all hunky with the house party, and they looked at him as a sort of wonderful freak, like a two-headed calf or the snake child or some such outrage. So when the party was over, round comes Peter, bustling with a new notion. What he calculated to do was to start a weather prophesying bureau, all on his own hook, with Baria for profit, and him for manager and general advertiser, and Jonadab and me to help put up the money to get her going. He argued that some of folks from Situate to Provincetown, on both sides of the Cape, would pay good prices for the real thing in weather predictions. The government bureau, so he said, covered too much ground, but Baria was local and hit her right on the head. His idea was to send Berea's predictions by telegraph to agents in every Cape town each morning, and the agents was to hand them to subscribers. First week a free trial, after that so much per prophecy. And it worked. Oh, land, yes, it worked. Peter's letters and circulars would satisfy anybody that black was white, and the free trial was a sure bait. I don't know why it is, but if you offered the smallpox free, there'd be a barrel of victims waiting in line to come down with it. Brown rigged up a little shanty on the bluff in front of the old home, and filled it full of barometers and thermometers and chronometers and charts, and put Berea and Eben inside to look wise and make believe do something. This was the office of the South Shore Weather Bureau, and was sort of sacred and holy and twould kill you to see the boarders tiptoeing up and peeking in the winder to watch them two old coots squintin' through a telescope at the sky or scribbling rubbish on paper. And Berea was right most every time. I don't know why. My notion is that he was born that way, same as some folks are born lightning calculators, but I'll never forget the first time Peter asked him how he done it. Wow, drawls Berea. Now today looks fine and clear, don't it? But last night my left elbow had rheumatiz in it, and this morning my bones ache, and my right toe gent is sore, so I know we'll have an easterly wind and rain this evening. If it been my left toe, now why... Peter held up both hands. That'll do, he says. I, I ain't asking any more questions. Only, if the boarders or outsiders ask you how you work it, you cut out the bones and toe business and talk science and temperature to beat the cars. Understand, do you? 
at science or no eight fifty in the pay envelope. Left toe joint, and he goes off grinning. We had to have Eben, though he wasn't worth a green hand's wages as a prophet, but him and Berea stuck by each other like two flies in a glue pot, and you couldn't hire one without t'other. Peter said twas all right, two prophets looked better than one anyhow. And as the subscriptions kept up pretty well, and the Bureau paid a fair profit, Jonadab and me didn't kick. In July, Mrs. Freeman, she had charge of the upper decks of the old home, and was rated head chambermaid, up and quit, and being as we couldn't get another capable Cape Codder just then, Peter fetched down a woman from New York, one that a friend of old Dillaway's recommended. She was able seaman so far as the work was concerned, but she'd been good-looking once and couldn't forget it, and she was one of them clippers that ain't happy unless they've got a man in tow. You know the kind, pretty nigh old enough to be a coal barge, but all rigged up with bunting and frills like a yacht. Her name was Kelly, Emma Kelly, and she was a widow, whether from choice or act of providence, I don't know. The other women servants was all down on her, of course, cause she had city ways and a style of wearing her togs that made their Sunday gowns and bonnets look like distress signals. But they couldn't deny that she was a driver so far as her work was concerned. She'd whoop through the hotel like a nor'easter and have everything done and done well by two o'clock in the afternoon. Then she'd be ready to dress up and go on parade to astonish the natives. Men, except the boarders, of course, was scarce around Wellmouth Port. First the Kelly lady began to flag Captain Jonadab and me, but we shut off and took to the offing. Jonadab, being a widower, had had his experience, and I never had the Marian disease and wasn't hankering to catch it. So Emma had to look for other victims, and the profit shop looked to her like the most likely feeding ground. And would you believe it, them two old critters, Berea and Eben, gobbled the bait like sculpins. If she'd been a woman like the kind they was used to, the cape kind, I mean, I don't suppose they'd have paid any attention to her. But she was different from anything they'd run up against, and the first thing you know, she had em both poke-hooked. Twas all in fun on her part, first along, I calculate. But pretty soon some idiot let out that both of em was worth money, and then the race was on, in earnest. She'd drop in at the weather factory long in the afternoon, and pretend to be terrible interested in the goings-on there. I don't see how you two gentlemen can tell what's going to rain or not. I think you are the most wonderful man. Do tell me, Mr. Crocker, will it be good weather tomorrow? I wanted to take a little walk up to the village about four o'clock, if it was. And then Berea'd swell out like a puffing pig, and put on airs, and look out of the window, and crow, Yes, am I judge that we'll have a southly breeze in the morning, and some fog, but nothing to last, nothing to last. The afternoon, I calculate, be fair. I, I, that is to say, I was figuring on going to the village myself tomorrow. Then Emma would pump up a blush and smile and purr that she was so glad, cause then she'd have company. And Eben would glower at Berea, and Berea would grin sort of superior-like, and mutual barometer, so to speak, would fall about a foot during the next hour. The brotherly business between the two prophets was coming to an end fast, and all on account of Mrs. Kelly. She played him even for almost a month didn't show no preference one way or t'other. First, twas Eben that seemed to be eaten up to windward, and then Berea catch a puff and gain for a spell. Captain Jonadab and me was uneasy, for we was afraid the weather bureau would suffer for the thing was done with, but Peter was away, and we didn't like to interfere till he come home. Then, all at once, Emma seemed to make up her mind, and twas all Eben from that time on. The fact is, the widder had learned, somehow or other, that he had the most money of the two. Berea didn't give up. He stuck to it like a good un, but he was falling behind, and he knew it. As for Eben, he couldn't help showing a little joyful pity, so's to speak, for his partner, and the atmosphere in that rain laboratory got so frigid 
but I didn't know but we'd have to put up a stove. The two wizards was hardly on speaking terms. The last of August come, and the old home house was going to close up on the day after Labor Day. Peter was down again, and so was Ebenezer and Belle, and there was to be high jinks to celebrate the season's wind-up. There was to be a grand excursion and clam bake at Situate Beach, and all hands was going, four cat boats full. Of course, the weather must be good, or it's no joy job taking females to Situate in a cat boat. The night before the big day, Peter came out to the weather bureau, and Jonadab and me dropped in likewise. Beria was there all alone. Eben was out walking with Emma. Well, Jeremiah, says Brown, chipper as a mackerel gull on a spar boy, what's the outlook for tomorrow? The government sharp says there's a big storm on the way up from Florida. Is he right or only an also ram, as usual? Well, says Maria, going to the door, I don't know, Mr. Brown. It don't look just right. I swan it don't. I can tell you better in the morning. I hope to be fair, too, because I was calculating to get a day off and borrow your horse and buggy and go over to the Ostable camp meeting. It's the big day over there, he says. Now, I knew, of course, that he meant he was going to take the widder with him, but Peter spoke up and says he, Sorry, Maria, but you're too late. Even asked me for the horse and buggy this morning. I told him he could have the open buggy. The other one's being repaired, and I wouldn't lend the new Surrey to the Grand Panjandrum himself. Even's going to take the fair Emma for a ride, he said. Maria, I'm afraid our beloved Cobb is, in the innocence of his youth, being roped in by the sophisticated damsel in the shoe-fly hat, says he. Me and Jonadab hadn't had time to tell Peter how matters stood betwixt the prophets, or most likely he wouldn't have said that. It hit Maria like a snowslide off a barn roof. I found out afterwards that the widow had more than half promised to go with him. He slumped down in his chair as if his mainmast was carried away, and he didn't even rise to blow for the rest of the time he was in the shanty, just sat there looking fishy-eyed at the floor. Next morning I met Eben prancing around in his Sunday clothes and with a necktie on that would make a rainbow look like a mourning badge. Hello, says I, you seem to be pretty chipper. You ain't going to start for that fifteen-mile ride through the woods to Ostable, be ya? Looks to me as if it was going to rain. The predictions for this day, says he, is cloudy in the forenoon, but clearing later on. Wind, southeast, changing to south and southwest. Did Maria send that out, says I, looking doubtful, for if ever it looked like dirty weather, I thought it did right then. Me, and Berea sent it out, he says, jealous-like, but I knew twas Berea's forecast, or he wouldn't have been so sure of it. Pretty soon out comes Peter, looking dubious at the sky. If it was anybody else but Berea, he said, I'd say this morning prophecy ought to be sent to Park. Where is the seventh son of the seventh son, the only original American seer? He wasn't in the weather shanty, and we finally found him on one of the seats way up on the edge of the bluff. He didn't look round when we come out, but just stared at the water. Hey, Elijah, says Brown. He was always calling Maria Elijah, or Isaiah, or Jeremiah, or some other prophet name out of Scripture. Does this go? And he held out the telegraph blank with the morning prediction on it. Maria looked round just for a second. He looked at me sort of sick and pale, that is, pale as his sunburned rhinoceros hide would ever turn. The forecast for today, says he, looking at the water again, is cloudy in the forenoon, but clearing later on, when south-east changing to sow and southwest. Right you are, says Peter Joyful. We start for Situate, then, and here's where the South Shore Weather Bureau hands another swift jolt to your Uncle Sam. So after breakfast, the catboats loaded up, the girls giggling and screaming, and the men-boarders dressed in what they hoped was sea-togs. They sailed away round the lighthouse and headed up the shore, and the wind was south-east sure and sartin, but the clearing part wasn't in sight yet. Maria didn't watch him go. He stayed in the shanty, 
but by and by when Eben drove the buggy out of the barn and Emma comes skipping down the piazza steps, I see him peeking out of the little winder. The Kelly critter had all sail sought and colors flying. Her dress was some sort of mosquito netting with wallpaper posies on it, and there was more ribbons flapping than there is reef pants in a mainsail. And her hat! Great guns! It looked like one of them pictures you see in a flower seed catalogue. Oh, she squeals when she sees the buggy. Oh, Mr. Cobb, ain't you afraid to go in that open carriage? It looks to me like rain. But even waved his flippers scornful. My forecast this morning says he is cloudy now, but clear and by and by. You trust to me, Miss Kelly. Weather's my business. Of course I trust you, Mr. Cobb, she says. Of course I trust you, but I should hate to spile my gown, that's all. They drove out of the yard fine as fiddlers, and I watched them go. When I turned round, there was Berea watching them, too, and he was smiling for the first time that morning. But it was one of them kind of smiles that makes you wish he'd cry. At half-past ten, it begun to sprinkle. At eleven, twas raining hard. At noon, twas a pourin', roarin' sou'easter, and looked good for the next twelve hours at least. "'Good Lord, Berea, says Captain Jonadab, running into the weather bureau. "'You've missed days this time, for sure. "'Has your prophecy works got indigestion?' he says. "'But Berea wasn't there. "'The shanty was closed, and we found out afterwards "'that he spent that whole day in the store down at the port. "'By two o'clock t'was so bad that I put on my isle skins "'and went over to Wellmouth and telephoned to the Situate Beach life-saving station to find out the clam bakers had got there right side up. They got there. Fact is, they was in the station then, and the language Peter hove through that telephone was enough to melt the wires. It was all in the shape of compliments to the prophet, and I heard Central tell him she'd reported to the head office. Brown said twas blowin' so they'd have to come back by the inside channel. That meant landing way up Harness Way and hiring teams to come to the port with from there. Twas nearly eight when they drove into the yard and come slopping up the steps, and such a passel of drowned rats you never see. The women folks made for their rooms, but the men hopped around the parlor, shedding puddles with every hop and hollering for us to trot out the head of the weather bureau. Bring them to me orders Peter, stopping to pick his pants loose from his legs, I yearn to caress him. And what old Dillaway said was worse than that. But Berea didn't come to be caressed. Twas quarter past nine when we heard wheels in the yard. By mighty, yells Captain Jonadab, it's the camp meeting pilgrims. I forgot them. Here's a show. He jumped to open the door, but it opened before he got there and Berea come in. He didn't pay no attention to the welcome he got from the gang, but just stood in the sill, pale, but grinning the grin that a terrier dog has on, just as you're going to let the rat out of the trap. Somebody outside says, Whoa, consarn ya! Then there was a thump and a sloshy stamping on the steps, and in come even and the widder. I had one of them long-haired foreign cats once that a British skipper gave me, it was a yeller and black one, and it fell overboard. When we fished it out, it looked just like the Kelly woman done then. Everybody but Maria just screeched. We couldn't help it. But the prophet didn't laugh. He only kept on grinning. Emma looked once round the room, and her eyes, as well as you could see em through the snarl of dripping hair and hat trimming, fairly snapped. Then she went up the stairs, three steps at a time. Even didn't say a word. He just stood there and leaked, leaked, and smiled. Yes, sir, his face, over the mess that had been that rainbow tie, had the funniest look of idiotic joy on it that ever I see. In a minute, everybody else shut up. We didn't know what to make of it. Twas Maria that spoke first. He, he, he chuckled. He, 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 he. Wasn't it kind of wet coming through the woods, Mr. Cobb? What does Mrs. Kelly think of the day her beau picked out to go camp meeting in? And even came out of his trance. But Rhea, says he, holding up a dripping flipper, shake. 
But Beria didn't shake, just stood still. I've got a surprise for you, shipmate, goes on Eben. Who did you say that lady was? Beria didn't answer. I begun to think that some of that wet soaked through the assistant prophet's skull and had give him water on the brain. You called her Miss Kelly, didn't you? gurgled Eben. Well, that ain't her name. Her and me stopped at the Baptist parsonage over to East Harness when we was on the way home and got married. She's Miss Cobb now, he says. Well, the queerest part of it was that twas the bad weather was really what brought things to a head so sudden. Eben hadn't spunked up anywhere near nigh enough courage to propose, but they stopped at Ostable so long, waiting for the rain to let up, that twas after dark when they was halfway home. Then Emma, oh, she was a slick one, said that her reputation would be ruined out that way with a man that want her husband. If they was married now, she said, and even a dummy could take that hint. I found Berea at the weather shanty about an hour afterwards with his head on his arms. He looked up when I come in. Mr. Wingate, he says, I'm a fool, but for the land's sake don't think I'm such a fool as not to know that this here storm was bound to strike today. I lied, he says. I lied about the weather for the first time in my life. Lied right up and down so as to get her mad with him. My reputation's gone forever. There's a feller in the Bible that sold his, his birthday, I think it was, for a mess of porridge. I'm him. Only and he groaned awful. They have cheated me out of the porridge. But you ought to have read the letters Peter got next day from subscribers that had trusted to the prophecy and had gone on picnics and such like. The South Shore Weather Bureau went out of business right then. End of Story 3 Story 4 The Dog Star it commenced the day after we took old man Stumpton out cod fishing. Me and Captain Jonadab both told Peter T. Brown that cod wa'n't biting much at that season, but he said cod be jiggered. What's troubling me just now is land and suckers, he says. So the four of us got into the Patience M. She's Jonadab's cat boat, and sought sail for the crab ledge. And we hadn't more than got our lines over the side than we struck into a school of dogfish. Now, if you know anything about fishing, you know that when the dogfish strike on, it's goodbye cod. So when Stumpton hauled a big fat one over the rail, I could tell that Jonadab was ready to swear. But do you think it disturbed your friend Peter T. Brown? No, sir. He never winked an eye. By Jove, he sings out, staring at that dogfish as if it was a gold dollar. By Jove, says he, that's the finest specimen of a Labrador mackerel ever I see. Bait up, Stump, and go at him again. So Stumpton, having lived in Montana ever since he was five years old, and not having sighted salt water in all that time, he don't know but what there is such critters as Labrador mackerel, and he goes at him hammer and tongs. When we come ashore, we had eighteen dogfish, four sculpin, and escaped and Stumpton was the happiest loon in Ostable County. It was all we could do to keep him from cooking one of them mackerel with his own hands. If Jonadab hadn't steered him out of the way while I sneaked down to the port and bought a bass, we'd have had to eat dogfish. We would, as sure as I'm a foot high. Stumpton and his daughter Maudina was at the old home house. Twas late in September, and the boarders had cleared out. Old Dillaway, Peter's father-in-law, had decoyed the pair on from Montana because him and some Wall Street shocks were figuring on buying some copper country out that way that Stumpton owned. Then Dillaway was took sick, and Peter, who was just back from his wedding tower, brought the Montana victims down to the Cape with the excuse to give them a good time along shore, but really to keep them safe and out of the way till Ebenezer got well enough to finish robbing them. Belle, Peter's wife, stayed behind to look after Papa. Stumpton was a great tall man, narrer in the beam and with a figurehead like a hen hawk. He enjoyed himself here at the Cape, 
He fished and loafed and shot at a mark. He sartinly could shoot. The only thing he was wishing for was something alive to shoot at, and Brown had promised to take him out duck shooting. Twas too early for ducks, but that didn't worry Peter any. He'd a had ducks to shoot at if he bought all the poultry in the township. Maudina was like her name, pretty, but sort of soft and mushy. She had big blue eyes and a baby face, and her principal cargo was poetry. She had a deck load of it, and she'd heave it overboard every time the wind changed. She was forever ordering the ocean to roll on, but she didn't mean it. I had her out sailing once when the bay was a little mite rugged, and I know. She was just out of a convent school, and you could see she wasn't used to most things, including men. The first week slipped along, and everything was serene. Bulletins from Ebenezer were encouraging every day, and no squalls in sight. But twas almost too slick. I was afraid the calm was a weather breeder, and sure enough, the hurricane struck us the day after that fishing trip. Peter had gone driving with Maudina and her dad, and me and Captain Jonadab was smoking on the front piazza. I was pulling at a pipe, but the captain had the home end of one of Stumpton's cigars harpooned on the little blade of his jackknife, and was busy pumping the last drop of comfort out of it. I never see a man who wanted to get his money's worth more'n Jonadab. I give you my word, I expected to see him swallow that cigar remnant every minute. And all to once he gives a gurgle in his throat. Take a drink of water, says I, scared like. Well, by time, says he, pointing. A feller had just turned the corner of the house and was heading up in our direction. He was a thin, lengthy craft with more than the average amount of wrist sticking out of his sleeves, and with long black hair trimmed aft behind his ears and curling on the back of his neck. He had high cheekbones and kind of sunk-in black eyes, and altogether he looked like Dr. Mark Guzlem, the celebrated Blackfoot medicine man. If he'd hollered, Sagwa bitters, only one dollar a bottle, I wouldn't have been surprised. But his clothes, don't say a word. His coat was long and buttoned up tight so you couldn't tell whether he had a vest on or not, though twas a safe bet he hadn't, and it and his pants was made of the loudest kind of black and white checks. No nice, quiet pepper and salt, you understand, but the checkerboard kind, the oilcloth kind, the kind that looks like the marble floor in the Boston post office. They was pretty tolerable seedy, and so was his hat. Oh, he was a last year's bird nest now, but when them clothes was fresh, whew, the northern lights and a rainbow mix couldn't have been more'n a cloudy day alongside of him. He run up to the piazza like a clipper coming into port, and he sweeps off that rusty hat and hails us grand and easy. Good morning, gentlemen, says he. We don't want none, says Jonadab, decided. The feller looked surprised. I beg your pardon, says he. You don't want any what? We don't want any Life of King Solomon, nor the world's big classifiers, and we don't want to buy any patent paint, nor sewing machines, nor clothes washes, nor climbing evergreen roses, nor rheumatiz salve, and we don't want our pictures painted neither. Jonadab was getting excited. Nothing riles him worse than a peddler, unless it's a woman selling tickets to a church fair. The feller swelled up until I thought the top button of that thunderstorm coat would drag anchor sure. You are mistaken, says he. I have called to see Mr. Peter Brown. He is, um, a relative of mine. Well, you could have blown me and Jonadab over with a cat's paw. We went on our beam then, so to speak. A relation of Peter T.'s? Why, if he'd been twice the panorama he was, we'd have let him in when he said that. Loud clothes, we figured, must run in the family. We remembered how Peter was dressed the first time we met him. Ya don't say, says I. Come right up and set down, Mr. Mr. Montague, says the feller, Booth Montague. Permit me to present my card. He drove into the hatches of his checkerboards and rummaged around but he didn't find nothing but holes, I judge, because he looked dreadful put out and begged our pardon, 
five or six times. Dear me, says he, this is embarrassing. I forgot my card case. We told him never mind the cards. Any of Peter's folks was more than welcome. So he come up the steps and sat down in a piazza chair like King Edward perching on his throne. Then he hove out some remarks about its being a nice morning, all in a condescending sort of way, as if he usually attended to the weather himself, but had been sort of busy lately and handed the job over to one of the crew. We told him all about Peter and Belle and Ebenezer and about Stumpton and Maudina. He was a good deal interested and asked considerable many questions. Pretty soon we heard a carriage rattling up the road. Hello, says I, I guess that's Peter and the rest coming now. Mr. Montague got off his throne kind of sudden. Ahem, says he, is there a room here where I may uh, receive Mr. Brown in a less public manner? It will be rather um, a surprise for him, and, well, there was a good deal of sense in that. I know twould surprise me to have such an image as he was sprung on me without any notice. We steered him into the gents' parlor and shut the door. In a minute the horse and wagon come into the yard. Ma Dina said she'd had a heavenly drive, and unloaded some poetry concerning the music of billows and pine trees and such. She and her father went up to their rooms, and when the decks was clear, Jonadab and me tackled Peter T. Peter says Jonadab, we got a surprise for you. One of your relations has come. Brown, he did look surprised, but he didn't act as if he was any too joyful. Relation of mine, says he. Come off. What's his name? We told him Montague, Booth Montague. He laughed. Wake up and turn over, he says. They never had anything like that in my family. Booth Montague. Sure, twant Algernon cough drops? We said no, twas Booth Montague, and that he was waiting in the gents' parlor. So he laughed again and said something about sending for Laura Lean Jibby. Then we started. The checkerboard fellow was standing up when we opened the door. Hello, Petey, says he, cool as a cucumber, and sticking out a foot and a half a wrist with a hand at the end of it. Now it takes considerable to upset Peter Theodosius Brown. Up to that time and hour, I'd have bet on him against anything short of an earthquake. But Booth Montague done it, knocked him plumb out of water. Peter actually turned white. Uh, great, he began, and then stopped and swallowed. Hank, he says, and sat down in a chair. The same, says Montague, waving the starboard extension of the checkerboard. Petey, it does me good to set my eyes on you, especially now, when you're the real thing. Brown never answered for a minute. Then he canted over to port and reached down into his pocket. Well, he says, how much? But Hank, or Booth, or Montague, whatever his name was, he waved his flipper disdainful. No, 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 Peter, my son, he says, smiling. It ain't how much this time. When I heard how you'd rung the bell the first shot out of the box and was rolling in coin, I said to myself, here's where the prod comes back to his own. I've come to live with you, Petey, and you pay the freight. Peter jumped out of the chair. Live with me, he says, you Friday evening amateur night. It's back to ten nights in a bar room for yours, he says. Oh, no, it ain't, says Hank, cheerful. It'll be back to Papa Dillaway and Belle. When I tell him I'm your little cousin Henry, and how you and me work the territories together, why, well, I guess there'll be gladness round the dear home nest, eh? Peter didn't say nothing. Then he fetched a long breath and motioned with his head to Captain Jonadab and me. We see we weren't invited to the family reunion, so we went out and shut the door. But we did pity Peter. I snum if we didn't. It was most an hour afore Peter come out of that room. When he did, he took Jonadab and me by the arm and led us out back of the barn. Fellas, he says, sad and mournful, that, that plaster cast in a crazy quilt, he says, referring to Montague, is a cousin of mine. That's the living truth, says he, and the only excuse I can make is that tain't my fault. 
He's my cousin, all right, and his name's Hank Schmultz. But the sooner you box that fact up in your forgetatory, the smoother twill be for yours drearily, Peter T. Brown. He's to be Mr. Booth Montague, the celebrated English poet, so long as he hangs out at the old home. And he's to hang out here until, well, until I can dope out a way to get rid of him. We didn't say nothing for a minute, just thought. Then Jonadab says, kind of puzzled, What makes you call him a poet, he says. Peter answers pretty snappy, Cause there's only two or three jobs that a long-head image like him could hold down, he says. I'd call him a musician if he could play Bedelia on a Jew's hop, but he can't, so he's got to be a poet. And a poet he was for the next week or so. Peter drove down to Wellmouth that night, bought some respectable black clothes, and the following morning, when the celebrated Booth Montague comes sailing into the dining room with his curls brushed back from his forehead and his new cutaway on and his wrists covered up with clean cuffs, blessed if he didn't look distinguished. At least, that's the only word I can think of that fills the bill. And he talked beautiful language, not like the slang he hove up browning us in the gents' parlor. Peter done the honors, introducing him to us and the Stumptons as a friend who come from England unexpected, and Hank, he bowed and scraped and looked absent-minded and crazy, like a poet ought to. Oh, he done well at it. You could see that twas just pie for him, and twas pie for Mardina, too. Then, as I said, kind of green concerning men folks, and likewise taken to poetry, like a cat to fish, she just fairly gushed over this fraud. She'd reel off a couple of fathom of verses from fellows named Spencer or Walla or such like, and he'd never turn a hair, but back he'd come and say they was good, but he preferred Confucius or Methuselah or somebody so antique that she nor nobody else ever heard of em. Oh, he run a safe course, and he had her in tow before they turned the first mark. Jonadab and me got worried. We see how things was going, and we didn't like it. Stumpton was having too good a time to notice, going after Labrador mackerel and so on, and Peter T. was too busy steering the cruises to pay any attention. But one afternoon I come by the summer house unexpected, and there sat Booth Montague and Maldina, him with a clove hitch round her waist, and she looking up into his eyes like they were peak holes in the fence round paradise. That was enough. It just simply couldn't go any further. So that night, me and Jonadab had a confab up in my room. Barzilla, says the captain, if we tell Peter that that relation of his is figuring to marry Modena Stumpton for her money, and that he's more likely to elope with her, will pretty nigh kill Pete, won't it? Now, sir, it's up to you and me. We've got to figure out some way to get rid of the critter ourselves. It's a wonder to me, I says, that Peter puts up with him. Why don't he order him to clear out and tell Belle if he wants to? She can't blame Peter, cause his uncle was father to an outrage like that. Jonadab looks at me scornful. Can't, hey? he says and her high-toned and chummin' in with the big bugs. It's easy to see you never was married, says he. Well, I never was, so I shut up. We sat there and thought and thought, and by and by I commenced to sight an I.D. in the often. Twas hauled down at first, but pretty soon I got it into speaking distance, and then I broke it gentle to Jonadab. He grabbed at it like the Labrador mackerel grabbed Stumpton's hook, we set up and planned till pretty nigh three o'clock, and all the next day we put in our spare time loading provisions and water aboard the patient's inn. We put grub enough aboard to last a month. Just at daylight, the morning after that, we knocked at the door of Montague's bedroom. When he woke up enough to open the door, it took some time, cause eatin' and sleepin' was his mainstay, we told him that we was planning an early morning fishing trip and if he wanted to go with the folks, he must come down to the landing quick. He promised to hurry, and I stayed by the door to see that he didn't get away. In about ten minutes, we had him in the skiff, rowing off to the patient's end. Where's the rest of the crowd? says he, when he stepped aboard. 
They'll be along when we're ready for em, says I. You go below there, will you, and stow away the coats and things. So he crawled into the cabin, and I helped Jonadab get up sail. We intended towing the skiff, so I made her fast astern. In half a shake we was under way and headed out of the cove. When the British poet stuck his nose out of the companion, we was abreast the pack. Ha! says he, scrambling into the cockpit. What's this mean? I was staring and feeling tolerably happy over the way things had worked out. Nice sailing breeze, ain't it? says I, smiling. Where's ma Miss Dumpton? he says, wild like. She's a, a bed, I calculate, says I, getting her beauty sleep. Why don't you turn in? Or are you pretty enough now? He looked first at me and then at Jonadab, and his face turned a little yellower than usual. What kind of a game is this? he asked, brisk. Where are you going? Twas Jonadab that answered, We're bound, says he, for the Bermudas. It's a lovely place to spend the winter, they tell me, he says. That poet never made no remarks. He jumped to the stern and caught hold of the skiff's painter. I shoved him out of the way and picked up the boat hook. Jonadab rolled up his shirt sleeves and laid hands on the centerboard stick. I wouldn't if I was you, says the captain. Jonadab weighs pretty close to two hundred, and most of it's gristle. I'm not quite so much, fur as tonnage goes, but I ain't exactly a canary bird. Montague seemed to size things up in a jiffy. He looked at us, then at the sail, and then at the shore, out over the stern. Done, says he, done, and by a couple of farmers. And down he sets on the thwart. Well, we sailed all that day and all that night. Of course, we didn't really intend to make the Bermudas. What we intended to do was to cruise around along shore for a couple of weeks, long enough for the Stumptons to go back to Dillaway's, settle the copper business, and break for Montana. Then we was going home again and turned Brown's relation over to him to take care of. We knew Peter would have some plan thought out by that time. We left a note telling him what we'd done, and saying that we trusted to him to explain matters to Modena and her dad. We knew that explaining was Peter's main bolt. The poet was pretty chipper for a spell. He sat on the thwart and bragged about what he'd do when he got back to Petey again. He said we couldn't get rid of him so easy. Then he spun yarns about what him and Brown did when they was out west together. They was interesting yarns, but we could see why Peter wa'n't anxious to introduce Cousin Henry to Belle. Then the patient's M got out where twas pretty rugged, and she rolled considerable, and after that we didn't hear much more from friend Booth. He was too busy to talk. That night me and Jonadab took watch and watch. In the morning it thickened up and looked squally. I got kind of worried. By nine o'clock there was every sign of a nor'easter, and we see we'd have to put in somewheres and ride it out. So we headed for a place we'll call Baytown, though that wa'n't the name of it. It's a queer, old-fashioned town, and it's on an island. Maybe you can guess it from that. Well, we run into the harbor and let go anchor. Jonadab crawled into the cabin to get some tobacco, and I was forward, coiling the throat halyard. All at once I heard oars rattling, and I turned my head. What I see made me let out a yell like a siren whistle. There was that everlasting poet in the skiff. You remember we'd been towing it astern, and he was just cutting the painter with his jackknife. Next minute he'd picked up the oars and was heading for the wharf, doubling up and stretching out like a frog swimming, and with his curls streaming in the wind like a rooster's tail in a hurricane. He had a long start, for Jonadab and me woke up enough to think of chasing him. But we woke up finally, and the way we flew round that catboat was a caution. I laid into them halyards, and I had the mainsail up to the peak before Jonadab got the anchor clear of the bottom. Then I jumped to the tiller, and the patient's M took after that skiff like a puff after a tomcat. We run alongside the wharf, just as Booth Hank climbed over the string piece. Got after him, Barzilla, hollers Captain Jonadab. I'll make a fast. Well, I hadn't took more'n three steps when I see it was going to be a long chase. 
Montague unfurled them thin legs of his and got over the ground something wonderful. All you could see was a pile of dust and coattails flapping. Up on the wharf we went and round the corner into a straggly kind of road with old-fashioned houses on both sides of it. Nobody in the yards, nobody at the windows. Quiet as could be, except that off ahead, somewheres, there was music playing. That road was a quarter of a mile long, but we galloped through it so fast that the scenery was nothing but a blur. Booth was gaining all the time, but I stuck to it like a good one. We took a short cut through a yard, piled over a fence, and come out into another road, and up at the head of it t'was a crowd of folks, men and women and children and dogs. Stop, thief! I hollers, and way astern I heard Jonadab bellering, Stop, thief! Montague dives head first for the crowd. He fell over a baby carriage, and I gained a tack for he got up. He wasn't more'n ten yards ahead when I come bustin' through, upsettin' children and old women, and landed what I guess was the main street of the place, and right abreast of a parade that was marchin' down the middle of it. First there was the band, four fellas tootin' and bangin' like foam-assed hands on a fishing smack in a fog. Then there was a big darky totin' a banner with Jenkins Unparalleled Double Uncle Tom's Cabin Company Number Two on it in big letters. Behind him was a boy leading two great savage-looking dogs, bloodhounds I found out afterwards, by a chain. Then come a pony cart with little Eva and Eliza child in it. Eva was all gold hair and beautifulness, and astern of her was Mox the lawyer on his donkey. There was lots more behind him, but these was all I had time to see just then. Now, there was but one way for Booth Hank to get across that street, and that was to bust through the procession. And, as luck would have it, the place he picked out to cross was just ahead of the bloodhounds. And the first thing I knew, them dogs stretched out their noses and took a long sniff and then burst out howling like all possessed. The boy, he tried to hold them, but t'was no go. They yanked the chains out of his hands and took after that poet as if he owed him something. And every one of the four million other dogs that was in the crowd on the sidewalks fell into line, and such howlin' and yappin' and scamperin' and screamin' you never heard. Well, t'was a mixed-up mess. That was the end of the parade. Next minute I was racing across country with the whole town and Uncle Thomas astern of me, and a string of dogs stretched out ahead fur as you could see. Way up in the lead was Booth Montague and the Bloodhound, and the way aft I could hear Jonadab yelling, Stop, thief! T'was lively while it lasted, but it didn't last long. There was a little hill at the end of a field, and where the poet dove over to the side of it the Bloodhounds all but had him. Before I got to the top of the rise, I heard the awfulest powwow going on in the holler, and, thinks I, they're eating him alive. But they weren't. When I hove in sight, Montague was setting up on the ground at the foot of the sandbank he'd fell into, and two hounds was rolling over him, lapping his face and going on as if he was their grandpa just home from sea with his wages in his pocket. And round them, in a double ring, was all the town dogs, crazy mad, and barking and snarling, but scared to go any closer. In a minute more the folks begun to arrive, boys first, then girls, and men, and then the women. Marx come trotting up, pounding the donkey with his umbrella. Here, lion, here, Tyre, he calls. Quit it, let him alone. Then he looks at Montague, and his jaw kind of drops. Why, why, Hank, he says. A tall, lean critter in a black coat and a yeller vest and lavender pants comes puffin' up. He was the manager, we found out afterward. Have they bit him? says he. Then he done just the same as Mark's. His mouth opened and his eyes stuck out. Hank Schmaltz by the livin' jingo, says he. Booth Montague looks at the two of em kind of sick and lonesome. Hello, Bonnie. How are you, Sullivan, he says. I thought t'was about time for me to get prominent. I stepped up and was just going to say something when somebody cups in ahead of me. Hum, says a voice, a woman's voice, and tolerable crisp and vinegary. Hmm, it's you, is it? I've been looking for you. 
"'Twas little Eva in the pony car. Her lovely posy hat was hanging on the back of her neck, her gold hair had slipped back so you could see the black under it, and her beautiful red cheeks was kind of streaky. She looked some older and likewise mad. Hmm, says she, getting out of the cart, it's you, is it, Hank Schmoltz? Well, perhaps you tell me where you've been for the last two weeks. What do you mean by running away and leaving your... Montague interrupted her. Hold on, Maggie, hold on, he begs. Don't make a row here. It's all a mistake. I'll explain it to you all right. Now, please explain, hollers Eva, kind of curling up her fingers and moving towards him. Explain, will you, why you miserable low-down. But the manager took hold of her arm. He'd been looking at the crowd, and I calculate he saw that here was the chance for the best kind of an advertisement. He whispered in her ear. Next thing I knew, she clasped her hands together, let out a scream, and runs up and grabs the celebrated British poet round the neck. Boo! says she. My husband! Saved! Saved! And she went all to pieces and cried all over his necktie. And then Mox trots up the child, and that young one hollers, Papa! Papa! and tackles Hank round the legs. And I'm blessed if Montague don't slap his hand to his forehead and toss back his curls and look up at the sky and sing out, My wife and babe restored to me after all these years. The heavens be thanked. Well, it was a sacred sort of time. The town folks tiptoed away, the men looking solemn but glad, and the women swabbing their dead lights and saying how affecting twas, and so on. Oh, you could see that show would do business that night if it never did afore. The manager got after Jonadab and me later on and did his best to pump us, but he didn't find out much. He told us that Montague belonged to the Uncle Tom's Cabin Company and that he'd disappeared a fortnight or so afore when they were playing at Hyannis. Eva was his wife and the child was their little boy. The bloodhounds knew him and that's why they chased him so. What was you two yelling stop thief after him for, says he? Has he stole anything? We says, no. Then why did you want to get him for, he says. Oh, we didn't, says Jonadab. We wanted to get rid of him. We didn't want to see him no more. You could tell that the manager was puzzled, but he laughed. All right, says he, if I know anything about Maggie, that's Mrs. Schmoltz, he won't get loose again. We only saw Montague to talk to but once that day. Then he peeked out from under the window shade at the hotel and asked us if we'd told anybody where he'd been. When he found we hadn't, he was thankful. You tell Petey, says he, that he's won the whole pot, Kitty and all. I don't think I'll ever visit him again, nor Belle, neither. I wouldn't, says I. They might write to Modena that you was a married man. And old Stumpton's been praying for something alive to shoot at, I says. The manager gave Jonadab and me a couple of tickets, and we went to the show that night. And when we saw Booth Hank Montague parading around the stage and defying the slave hunters and telling them he was a free man standing on the Lord's free soil and so on, we realized it would have been a crime to let him do anything else. As an imitation poet, says Jonadab, he was a kind of mildewed article, but as a play actor, well, there may be some that can beat him, but I never see him. End of story four.